Welcome everyone. Going to get started here in just a minute. Okay, um, our panelists are welcome to join the room now. Um, I'm gonna get through the, uh, the introductory uh, comments and in introductions of the panelists here. I'm uh, fully draped in, uh, in branding from the Virginia Book Festival, um, specifically this writing workshop. Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, the Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, a conversation with Felicia Rose Chavez, hosted by Randolph College MFA, as part of the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. I'm Chris Gommer. I am the Assistant Director of the Randolph College Master in Fine Arts Program, your host for this evening. Thank you for joining us. This event is one in a series of six devoted to Virginia writing and publishing presented by writing centers and organizations across Virginia, including 1455 Literary Arts, James River Writers, the Muse Writers Center, Randolph College MFA, Watershed Lit, Center for Literary Engagement and Publishing Practice, and Writer House. The full series of Virginia writing and publishing events are available at virginiabook.org, where you can also explore the full festival schedule and watch past events. Uh, while you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Felicia Rose Chavez, author of the Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, how to Decolonize the Creative Writing Classroom. The Creative Classroom is an award-winning educator with an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Iowa. Thank you for joining us, Felicia. Uh, Felicia and our moderator, Eloisa Mezcua is from Arizona. Her debut collection from the inside quietly is the inaugural winner of the Shelter Belt Poetry Prize selected by Ada Limon, a McDowell Fellow. Her second collection of poems, Fighting Like a Wife, is forthcoming from Coffee House Press. Eloisa is Randolph MFA faculty. Thank you all for joining us today. Felicia, Eloisa, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I was really excited when... Um, it's bad. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was really excited when Randolph reached out to me because I'm such a fan, Felicia, of your, both your, your writing um, and your writing on education and pedagogy and all these things, but also your work as an editor. And I think um, now that I know, you know, like after reading um, the anti-racist workshop, it really gave me a sense of like, you know, because you worked on the Latinx uh, anthology, the Breakbeats anthology. Yes. Um, and I feel like that reading that and then going back to that anthology, I saw so much uh, of the work that you talk about in anti-racist writing workshop put into practice for editing. Um, so I just found that really fascinating and it, and it gave me like a new layer um when approaching that anthology so thank you also for your work as an editor um okay that's the first i've ever heard of someone really? drawing a connection like that and that's um that's really beautiful and i appreciate that thank you yeah i, I mean it shouldn't go unnoticed right that like the things that you are writing about in this one book are also being put into practice you know in a very like intimate space the classroom but also in a very public split space like in um in the publishing world so yeah i think it's really awesome and i hope 
you do more anthologies um, and obviously publish more of your own work too. Um, so sorry to derail the conversation. I had like a very particular thing we were going to start with. I was <laughs> like, we cool. got to talk about the yeah. anthology. <laughs> um, so one of the the talking point I did want to begin with um, is I loved so much in the book the how you write uh, about silence. Um, and how you write about listening. Um, because I think those are two qualities of the writing workshop that are overlooked um, often, uh, especially when it comes to the, um, the workshop participant, right? Like, or the person being workshopped, whose writing is being workshopped. Um, so I know you had a passage that you were gonna read for us. Um, so if we could start with that, I'd love to, give some context for for the the viewers. Sure. So this thank you everyone who's present. Um thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. Um I'm excited. I so I wanted to pull this part from the introduction in terms of context. Um because I push my students to re-engage with their kind of learning journeys, right? So that they're not settling comfortably into passivity, but instead they're charged with being active participants in that journey. Um, and so um, I'll start with this excerpt and then we'll transition into the second, which is about deep listening. Um, in conference, I suggest that the students focus less on the workshop critique they received and more on the prompts they provide. Did they ask pointed questions to elicit specific insightful feedback? Or were they passive, vague, sacrificial storytellers awaiting the knife? Is it any good? My white male students tend to ask, well accustomed to instantaneous response, confident in their place in the world, their effortless access to attentive ears. They balk at politeness as though it were backward. I don't want to be spoken to that way. I want callousness, the truth. Unlike their peers of color, their lives do not depend on civility and cooperation. Can't we all just speak our minds is the unknowable privilege of white people. It's a clever invitation, a sly smile, a loaded gun, because say the wrong thing, and I have when enforcing my course policies regarding attendance, participation, deadlines, and boom, their fathers fire patronizing emails about what their sons deserve, not what they've earned, but what they deserve. And just like that, the game of being real, of taking it, is over. And so I'll we'll jump forward um, to the concluding part of the introduction, um, referring back to that request by these white students for callousness and the truth. If we're aiming for truth, young men, then here it is. I'm at peace with the occasional white workshop participants' discomfort because it's evidence that the anti-racist model is working. For the first time in their artistic careers, white writers must listen to multidimensional storytelling, to marginalized narratives, to the anxieties and aspirations of their peers without a single appeal for their opinion. Listening is the first and most important step for maintaining a storytelling tradition. And as such, we must practice it daily. Writers of color are accustomed to this practice, burdened with ears so elastic, we're capable of hearing multiple simultaneous subtexts in every exchange. At heart, the anti-racist writing workshop imparts a pedagogy of deep listening. We invest in one another as complex individuals. We confront the voices in our heads that tell us our stories are unimportant. We honor the sidelined narratives of people of color, women, queer, differently abled and gender non-conforming artists. We listen to one another's writing, read aloud in workshop, ever conscious of our body language. We ask questions with the intent to understand instead of retort. 
We read for craft over content, regardless of our subjectivity, and we adhere to the author's agenda during feedback sessions. It requires self-discipline, to be sure, but cultivating listening in the creative classroom makes us better writers. We're more present in our lives, better able to articulate what it is to be human. The resulting work rings with vitality. Without a single appeal for their opinion. Right, like that really, that part of that passage stuck out to me. So, like it, yeah, I, it, it just reframed for me what, um, you know, I came to writing in a very traditional writing workshop format setting. You weren't allowed to speak. Um, you know, you, you just sat there and listened to other people talk. Um, and that and and how that connects to the entitlement right of, of being able to um believe that your opinion mm -hmm. matters a and b like is valuable uh to everyone else in the room right um how has you know, we're coming up on like the third, well, no, it, it's begun the third year of, of this weird sort of online virtual world um, where you can mute yourself, mm. right? And you can turn your camera off and, and you can remove yourself while still being there. So how, you know, in your own teaching practice, how has this sort of Zoom virtual world shifted the the writing workshop where silence is like eerily always present mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's you know i'm thinking back years um to when i was an undergraduate at depaul university and i transferred to the school and i was super into its like nonprofit initiative i had this um this great minor of community service studies. So I was zipping across town all the time and that felt so um, informative to my education. But then I'd be planted in class and I'd be you know, the target of conversations like, oh, well, Felicia, why don't you tell us about race? Or Felicia, why don't you tell us about class? Like relay your experience and enlighten your peers, right? And I had a professor who just couldn't get it. He was like, you know, there was a pole in the middle of class and um, I would sit right behind that pole and I would hide my face most of the time. I would either be looking down, making notes or just kind of leaning. <laughs> I was so in a way, right? I was turning off my screen. Right. Like I just wanted to disappear from the room because I couldn't one stand being the target of like educate your peers in this exchange or um the the lack of um shared knowledge about legitimate alternate lived experiences was just damning to me like it was so difficult to to endure um a, a sense of ignorance when it came to issues of class um especially and so um i understand the impulse right i get so much of the psychology and the emotion that we carry with us when we enter a space to learn together and the opportunity to mute ourselves or turn off our camera um there's a lot of folks out there who i absolutely respect um who you know are who declare that that is an anti-racist kind of um tool that's an option for these students right who don't want to expose their right home life or or so much about themselves through the visual um i i come at a point of contrast to that right, right? and i i want the cameras on and i want the microphone on. I want to engage. Um, I, I feel like we're training collectively, um, you know, part of that pedagogy of deep listening. It's not always outward, it's often inward. And so how can we convince ourselves to turn inside again and again and again to access the power that we all have, but we aren't like attuned to access because we've um, been, been, trained to to doubt that inner power to neglect it right so um it's 
essential to me that we are all present, that we see that there are bodies in the room, right? That there are students. We're not just products that we're putting forth, but we're whole people. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do stand in contrast to the request for, for that privacy and that sense of claiming of space. And I, as I said, I, I respect and understand, and yet I, I contradict. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew you're allowed to contradict yourself? Well, uh, I'm, I thought, I'm not going to tell on you. <laughs> okay. All right. uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. And it is, uh, aside from Randolph, I don't teach and I never wanted to teach in a very traditional setting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I knew going into graduate school that that wasn't for me. Um, those sorts of spaces, uh, you know, and I often have questioned like, is the way I was brought up in workshop um, and the way I was taught to sort of understand my own writing, uh, how has that affected my relationship with teaching um, and with the way I, I hope to engage with students, right? And then where I'm falling short and where I'm not meeting that. Um, and I know for myself personally, and I say this with full candor, understanding that there are students uh, from Randolph in the attendee list, you know, uh, I find myself defaulting to what I thought was my strength, right? Which is editing. Um, and you are also an editor. Um, so how do you balance that? You know, Cause I feel like so much of what I learned in workshop was how to be a critic, right? How to critique, how to have opinions about writing. Um, and I find myself trying to hold back that impulse mm -hmm. to edit and to be the critic and to impart, you know, my opinion uh, mm -hmm. on a student. So, you know, how, what do you find to be those tools to kind of like quiet the editor, quiet the critic and engage with the student, not just the work, but the student as a whole? I am the first to admit that I am so controlling. It is so hard for me. Like if you handed me a piece of writing like on your computer and we're just like, redo it, like edit it in the sense of like, go in and I would fully be on board, right? It's that impulse to control that I see as an expression of, or an extension of a tradition of white supremacy, right? It's the colonization of someone else's ideas, language, history, heart, right? You, you are manipulating it um, to better serve yourself. And we don't like to think about it that way. It sounds terrible. But um, when I had to confront that in my own teaching practice, right, I had to step back and invite the student into the conversation. And so a lot of the practices that I put forth in the anti-racist writing workshop and in these series of professional development workshops that I offer are just tools for inviting students to meet you in the middle, right? So you provide the scaffolding and they provide the leadership. So as I talk about in the book, I mean, I go so far as to sit outside, physically outside of a workshop circle as a reminder and a restraint to myself that you are not facilitating, moderating, guiding, controlling this conversation. You are here to listen to how students are workshopping, right? And then when you're in conference with the student one-on-one -on -one, and the student is guiding that conference, just as they guided their own feedback session, um, you're fully present and responding to their prompts. Um, what do they want to know about their own work? You follow suit, right? And that's um, allowing students that leadership helps me to stay on point. Um, and as I said, stay present, which is a really beautiful thing for an educator because there's so much, um, just as a writer, right? There's so many choices on the page, yeah. but there's so much to negotiate in a classroom that when you can fully be present and like sit with your students and understand, um, as part of that pedagogy of deep listening, their impulse and what they're working, what fear they're working through, right? To create this piece that they've just handed over to you. It's now less important to provide them with in-depth line edits, do this and this and this, when you know, and they've expressed to you because you've heard them that they've never written about this particular 
period in their life and they're terrified to do it. And so it, what would once be an exchange of, um, of, of excessive criteria for change is now an exchange of congratulations, pride, right? Um, curiosity, what, what was the process like creating this? What do you hope for this piece for the next draft, right? It's an exercise of listening um, and that mindfulness. And so I found really beautiful gifts for me as a result of just stepping back and letting go. So that's the question, how much can I let go? And for students, it's like, what writing can happen from exactly the way you are, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And how do you handle students, um, you know, or how do you engage with students or at what point are the students who participate in these anti-racist writing workshops um, when when the conversation or the goal uh, starts to move towards publishing? Sure. Um, what's cool about this sort of exchange is that it's individualized. Mm -hmm. So while I'm providing exercises and opportunities in class, um, we're balancing that with those kind of one-on-one -on -one exchanges in conference, which a lot of educators just want to like throw their hands up in the air when they hear that, like, who has time? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Right. But I balance that in so many other ways. I'm letting go of so many of our traditions that take up sap so much of our time and energy, right? And instead, um, rechanneling that to these conversations and, and that gift of time. And so um, every student has the opportunity to set an agenda for that particular conference. Um, so they can talk about emotional anxieties. They can talk about methodology. They can talk about mentor texts and, and how they want to revise. Um, I've had students come to my side of the desk and say, you know, slap their draft down and say, edit it line by line and tell me what you're doing and why, because I really want to learn how to do this. Right. right. And so we'll, we'll deeply study that first page and all of the moves and we'll talk through it. We'll ask questions of one another. We'll gain understanding. Right. But um, in that way, we're just um, having the opportunity to um, showcase that skill set without just receiving like, you know, um, marks, like change this, change this, change this now publish here, because I think this is a good fit, but instead, um, working through what editing looks like and understanding the moves, the student goes on to finish the piece, bring it back to me in another conference, maybe for a full read. Um, and then we talk about who is the audience for this piece right. without, um, assuming you know, that there's uh, an audience of, of white readers or that were, you know, um, sacrificing this piece to a, to a white publishing industry, but instead, um, who, who are you reaching out toward, right? And, and sometimes it's enough to say it's for me. Um, and, and we talk about those possibilities of self-publishing. Sometimes it's, you know, these, these online amazing platforms that have sprouted up um, and then are incredible um, or more traditional kind of um, physical um, lit journals um, uh, and then obviously books beyond that. So I'm open to as many different conversations and pivoting the conversation as students that I have. Um, so there's never um, you know the the only thing keeping them from having the conversation is themselves, right? And do you find that, you know, you do have so much experience in all these different avenues as a writer, editor, um, obviously teacher, educator, uh, you know, what would you say to an edu to someone who only has like one avenue of those, right? I'm a writer, but I've never taught writing workshops. So I don't know much about the, these other avenues or I'm a, I'm an educator, but I've never published. How do I, you know, if a student wants to engage about or wants to make their goal to publish something, um, 
because I love, you know, what I love so much about the model is that it allows students to be them, their whole selves. Um, but how as an educator, can you al allow yourself that freedom as well? I like to um, diversify my reading lists and I don't mean diversify in the worst way. I mean it <laughs> as though as, as, as um, curating right folders that are each craft oriented so you've got imagery as a folder and you're um, asking students to access that folder to find mentorship right and within that folder it's it's a, a multimedia spectrum so you're not limiting it to the particular genre within which you're working um right you've got a podcast episode you've got a graphic novel you've got a um a poem you've got a song you've got a, a tv episode it could be anything right um that exemplifies imagery and this craft right. element you're aiming to get at um you have um as many samples from online lit journals as possible from young writers who you would not necessarily sit and say, oh, that's the most amazing thing I've ever read. This person's gonna go on to win this award, right? And they're launching their, their... you're like, this is great. This person can be a mentor to my students. One, because of who they are. Two, because of the writing that they're, you know, um, al allowing us to sit with. Um, but, but three, because of um, of the fact that they're accessible, right? So I think in um, kind of slant wise, showcasing for your students, hey, these platforms exist. Right. Young writers publish on them. Young writers of color publish on them. There's a POC friendly or whatever it may be kind of platform. You're nudging them closer to their own identity as a writer and potentially, um, you know, showcasing for them that their, their work could potentially feature on, on that particular platform. So I don't think that you have to be an editor, you have to be a writer to expose students to possibilities without pressuring them. Like I hear about courses in which publishing is part of, and I've actually experienced a course in which publishing was part of the requirement, right? You workshop yeah. this draft twice, and then you send it out to these literary journals. And I was sending out to like, I was like, what's the most prestigious literary journal out there? Like We're getting I'm, this in the Kenyan Review. Totally, tonight. right? I'm like, <laughs> this is where this belongs. I had no, I've never read it. I have no idea, but I'm like, this is the fancy one that everybody knows and my work deserves to be there, right? And so it's ridiculous. Like I think um, when you unburden students of that imperative to publish because sometimes we don't write to publish. Sometimes we write for ourselves or we write for our families or whatever it may be. We write to heal. Um, you know, you're just exposing them and in that exposure, you're, you're leading them, you know, yeah. to a potential publishing source. I hope that answered your question. I no, feel it like does. it definitely yeah. does. And, okay. and what, I, you know, no one has, this levels everything, right? Like no one has to be the all knowing person in the room or the the expert in everything in the room. Um, and one part that I love so much is this idea of uh, like grounding craft, right? That craft are, it's not some, you know, intangible, undescribable sort of thing that some people have and others don't, right? It's, it's a learned skill. Mm -hmm. um, and so once we all define those skills and those moves and or whatever you want to call it for for ourselves and each other it like levels the playing field right of like what um of what the the sort of like dictionary for the workshop is going to be right and what we can point to together um as as you're set, you're like laying the terms for the for the class um you know and what how do you as an educator how do you approach you know students who want to be the expert right who are like eager to impart and that's a personality trait for some people or it's you know a a defense mechanism 
Um, so how do you engage with, with a student who is trying to maybe dominate the space? Well, in terms of what you just talked about, right, we're, we're negotiating the terms, um, recognizing that they're malleable, recognizing that, you know, I've had one class that defined voice as um, clarity and precision. I had another class that chose, right, they're self-selecting their definitions. They chose to define it as originality. Find your voice. Everybody has their own voice, right? Another class that defined it um, as like rhythm, energy, kind of that movement, right? It could mean all three things. Um, and we just assume that we're all stepping into the room and using that word and meaning the same thing. So we've got crosswires like all the time, crossfires. Um, and so I, I think that it's, um, it's lovely to have what I call the scaffolding, right? The, the language of craft, we share that. And then we can all be experts in what that thing means. We can all use that language with confidence when we talk about and engage in independent workshop with our own work and then move on to kind of peer review, small group, large group workshop in which we're exchanging ideas with others. Um, we can all kind of, you know, command that language. Um, and the more that they take on the responsibility of workshop protocol, leading that workshop, um, you know, um, asking their, their peers for what worked in their piece, statements of meaning, asking their peers for, um, you know, three points of, of feedback that they'd like about their own work. Um, again, using the language of craft, not is it any good, but like, how do you feel about the characterization rendered in page four, right? The more that they can own that role, that is confidence, that is right. command, that is everything that um, I want for them, but they're channeling it to be leaders, right? Mm -hmm. Of the conversation around their own work. And then they can channel it again to be listeners, to ask really good questions, smart questions about one another's text, right? And then to come to that, ask permission to share a particular opinion or an insight that they have about a prescriptive note for someone else's work. Right. They have opportunity to do all of these things, but it's just, um, it's, it's, it's taking that energy and finding really positive kind of pathways to lead it into so that they're growing as leaders and individuals and writers, um, as well as community members. Yeah. And what I love so much about that, you know, one thing I do really appreciate about my, uh, my own education and writing workshops, um, is that it was very, uh, one workshop professor in particular, John Scoyles, um, was really wonderful about uh, teaching us how to be our own editors, right? Mm -hmm. to, to learn our own uh, habits and like quirks and, and to recognize those things, you know? He would say like, and this is still true, unfortunately, I haven't unlearned this, but I use the word of, a million times in a five line poem because i it's just my favorite preposition no idea why uh you know and he, he would just say like how many times did you use of in this poem and i'd like look and i'd be like oh my god i used of 12 times and it's 18 lines um and so it was a really wonderful way to like learn my own writing mm -hmm. um and i and i love this idea of, of empowering the students or the workshop participants to like take control over their own writing because it is such an intimate experience right to sit down and write to find the time and space to do it you know and, and all the craziness um and that intimate emotional perhaps draining moment then becomes like this very what can feel like public shocking abrasive thing in a workshop. Um, and so I like that, you know, what's something I loved about this workshop model is that it, you can like hold on to that intimacy a little bit longer as the writer, right. As a participant, 
Um, and there's not this fear that like this, this moment of creation is now going to become this thing that you want to avoid or that you're not looking forward to doing the next time because you're worried about what's going to happen after that, right? When it gets to the workshop. Um, yeah. So I love that, that like self-care that comes with this, this workshop model, like both self-learning and self-care. I like that perspective because I think that, you know, the practice, as you say, is to silo and to suffer, silo, suffer, silo, suffer, independent, <laughs> like, you know, private exchanges with the self in terms of, of our writing process. And then there's the big reveal here it is, here's the product. Um, and we try to separate ourselves from the product. Like we weren't, you know, intricately, at the it, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see that, but I also see workshop as being so much more than the big reveal. If we mm-hmm. limit it to that, like that's, that is mind blowing to me because I have students workshopping, their very relationship to reading and writing. They're mm-hmm. workshopping ideas. They're workshopping first lines. There were, you know, we're in constant conversation about our drafts so that they are not this private piece, so that we're not um, so removed from that final product. We've kind of rooted for and been with this student writer throughout the process um, so that we are that much more human to one another by the time we, we do engage with those more evolved drafts down the line. Um, But I also am a big, big, big believer in independent workshop. And this is something that Mm. I'll speak to at AWP this year, actually, um, virtually. Um, But it is uh, essential to me that my students serve as their first reader and their target reader and really learning what that means, right? So that when we workshop, when we've discovered something um, and, and put it down on the page, that we're the first to engage with those ideas. And I have a whole variety of um, uh, um, exercises for students to engage in to um, independently workshop their work before they ever hand it over to anybody else. And I think that that's where the real learning happens, mm-hmm. but it's also where those extensions of self love self-care as you call it right happen because it's like it's okay to like something about your piece oh my gosh if you don't like it what's the point well but there's so (laughs) much hate that we can express about our work together (laughs) I know I know that part's really bad I try like I'm I'm sorry this is brand new yeah sorry you have to read it (laughs) exactly exactly but it's okay to love something like something be proud of something about what we produce um recognizing that it's just one part in something that's ongoing and will continue to grow I love that and I, I hope all of us are able to read and or view this AWP virtual talk that you're going to be presenting. Will you give us one exercise? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, as you're one talking, that we can take home with ourselves. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, as you're talking and thinking, I do that, like that, that exercise that you spoke of about studying your own work. I actually do a guided analysis. So I'll have students, um, you know, believe that they're handing in a piece of work on a certain day. They've worked toward this deadline. They come in with the draft ready to just kind of passively hand it over to me. But instead um, I dim the lights and we are looking at a screen and they're going through part by part, right? Um, You know, it can vary and it can get more and more complicated depending on kind of the craft expectations of the piece. But we can start so simple as um, an analysis of the shape of your paragraphs. And everyone has a set of highlighter markers at their desk um, and they're, you know, marking, they're color coding their paragraphs, right? Um, If we're working with a piece of prose. Uh, And a a lot of my younger writers are like, oh, Paragraphs are supposed to be different lengths, like what, you know, right? And then we talk about five sentences. <laughs> we talk about different um, sentence types, and we kind of free it from any sort of grammatical 
language, right? It's not a run-on sentence, but it's a, it's a freight train sentence. What effect does this sentence have on the reader? Mm-hmm. When a sentence is really long, what does it, what do we want to call that, right? What is, what does it build in the reader? Or when a sentence is super short and it's inserted after a series of long sentences, what effect does that have on the reader and what should we call it? So we give them all names mm-hmm. in this, we're having conversations about different types of sentences, and then students will color code their text. Um, and they'll find that a lot of times you know, they're using the same sentence type over and over again. Again, it can extend and extend to different craft elements, even as minute as punctuation, right? Um, But it's serving as um, uh, an opportunity to study your writing habits on the page without handing it over to anybody else or without anybody telling you. You're seeing for yourself that you're using that favorite word of over and over again because it's highlighted in green like 12 times, right? So (laughs) um, it's just just recognizing your own moves on the page and making decisions for yourself after that. So they'll um, turn in the real draft the next day after going home and editing. That's incredible. I love this. Okay. This was so wonderful. What a, yeah. Thank you so much for this. Uh, Will you close out with the letter? Sure. Yes. So this is how I close the book. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed having a conversation with you. Thank you. So this comes at the end and it's, um, it felt so right to, um, to make a connection, to build something. That's what I'm trying to do, not present a replicable model, do this, do this, do this, but like, here's what works for me, what works for you. Let's grow this thing together, right? Dear reader, A police car parked in front of my house yesterday, blocking the driveway. My seven-year-old son watched from the window. They can't come for us if we didn't do anything wrong, right, daddy? He asked. My husband, a black man, laughed. We needed to go to the grocery store, so my husband took a picture of the police car and posted it on Instagram then handed me a post-it note on which he had written the phone number of an older white male colleague. He walked away from me and toward the police officer. My body said, no, don't go, please, I'll go. All that long driveway, my body pulsing with something's wrong, this is wrong. My son chased after him, wait for me, daddy. And I stood outside the garage with tears in my eyes, past and present and future blurring into one. And then it was, good morning, sir. And if it's not too much trouble, sir. He was just doing paperwork, my son explained as we backed out of the driveway. But I was silent and my husband was silent. And it was a long time before either of us said anything. What do our bodies do with all we don't say? Does your body suffer too, knowing what it knows? That it's wrong. The everyday shootings, the children caged, the blue lights and brown boys, men dead, the endless assault by white supremacy, power, control, domination. How do we reconcile this knowledge? Do we bow our heads, swallow the scream, get on and off Facebook? Maybe this book can teach us voice, to speak out, to speak back, to say what we know but don't allow ourselves to feel because to do so would be equal parts pain and pardon. Maybe this book can teach me courage because the closer I get to finishing, the more fearful I am of its reception. I was so sure at the beginning that this project was my life's purpose. But now that I'm a month away from giving birth to my second son, I surprise myself by wondering, all that ugliness, is it worth it? Ugliness on ugliness on death. How do we mourn racism and live racism and fight racism all at once? 
Maybe this book in committing words onto the page is a success in and of itself. Who cares if every time I read the words aloud, I cry. This is my life's work, but it's also my life's story. The pedagogy is necessarily personal. I can only hope that someone, somewhere, might read it and attempt a different way, a better way, freeing our bodies to speak more and suffer less. I am so tired, grief-stricken, and afraid. Lend me your hope. They say that a writer's work must stand alone, that I won't be there when you pick up my book, but maybe I can be if you let me. Maybe we can build this thing together. In solidarity, Felicia. Thank you so much, Felicia. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hand it over to Chris Gomer. Thank you, Felicia. Um, we everyone feel free to throw some some nice comments in the comment box and thank our uh, Felicia and, and Eloisa for joining us. And I'm going to read the outro script here to to close things up uh, and to thank everyone who's who's watching. Um, please consider buying uh, this book, the Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, um, and the other featured books from the Virginia Book Festival from your local independent bookseller or using the links provided on vabook.org. You can also check out other events in the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming, for our, our hosts, uh, Eloisa, and then for uh, Felicia for um, bringing her words. Thank you. <laughs>